Hi, it's Aaron, yeah. Um, I'm Maida Humphrey. I'm a PhD student at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and today I'm going to be presenting on part of my study, which is looking at the impact of changes to primary care on marginalised groups and specifically the digitalisation of services. So today I'm going to be focusing on telephone consultations and the potential impact of that um, for vulnerable groups. So starting with a quote, and I'm going to read all quotes out as we go, so you don't need to. But on the phone, I can't do that. I can't show them on the phone, so it's what I say, and I'm not saying a lot. So that kind of sums up a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, in terms of background, obviously there's been a huge increase in the use of telephone consultations since COVID-19, um, but it stayed relatively high, and this orange line just shows the increase for um, most private groups. Um, in the most deprived quintile, which has actually gone from being the lowest users of telephone consultations to just above average. I'm going to whiz through this, um, but in terms of how I'm defining marginalisation, um, I'm recognising it as having overlapping, um, people have overlapping compounding characteristics. Um, marginalisation is intersectional, it's part of a process, it's not an identity, no one is born, well you are born marginalised, but it's not part of your identity, it's a process that happens to people. And the populations I've been speaking to are unreached, not hard to reach as we often call them. So in terms of the context um, of the data I'm going to be going through with you today, it was from a qualitative study I ran November to May last year. Um, during a time of flux, it was when COVID-19 was still, I guess still is ongoing, but it was during the Omicron wave. Data was collected from three primary fieldwork sites, um, including a food bank, a drop-in centre for migrants, refugees and asylum seekers, and a community hub which worked mostly with people with drug and alcohol addictions um, and experiencing street homelessness. So the data is going to be from the 15 interviews I ran with this group and 84 hours of observation at these fieldwork sites. I've also been interviewing GPs, digital health hub staff and service staff at each of these sites, but I won't be going through that data today. So firstly, one of the big challenges with remote consultations is language. So while someone might be able to speak English well in person with their doctor, over the phone it could be much more difficult. So this is a quote from an Eritrean refugee I spoke to, who said to me, I think by phone it's very difficult to tell my problem. Because I not speak English well, I don't know my problem by English, how can I say? So it's a little bit difficult for me. I said, well, what happens if you're doing it face to face? And she says, well, I can point at my body. So during the remote consultation, she loses the capacity to gesture. So it's not only about visual communication showing an injury, but being able to point to where it is on the body. So this creates articulation work for patients. So they have to be able to articulate their concerns, their healthcare needs without the use of any um, gesturing, which may be outside of language capacities when done over the phone. Secondly, and related, um, there are problems around visual communication. So visual communication is different from gestures in terms of actually showing like a skin rash um, to the doctor, not even needing to speak about it. And this participant says, when it's face to face explaining certain things, I don't have to do a lot of talking. I just show them, you know, so they get the full scenario. Then you go on the phone. I can't do that. I can't show them on the phone. And so it's what I say. And I'm not saying a lot. So as well as being able to gesture, people also lose the ability to communicate visually, which is particularly challenging if you have low health literacy or communication needs um, or challenges more generally. Um, so this was an individual who was um, English. Um, he had some partial paralysis from congenital disorder that he was born with, and he, he really struggled to, to articulate his, his needs and to articulate himself in general. Um, so this was kind of a challenge for him when having remote consultation. And on top of that, you also need health literacy. So aside from having kind of visual communication showing and English language um, capacity, you also may need certain language to talk about your body. So again, this is the same individual saying, when they want to reply, that's what I'm thinking. I haven't got enough time to say that. I can. And if it's not enough, I lose out. And that's what I've been doing, losing out. I don't know how to explain it. So patients are also being asked to monitor their bodies and identify their own needs. So identifying what is happening in their body in a way that they can then articulate that 
to a, to a GP over the phone in a way that is comprehensible to them. So that's the difference between someone walking in, for instance, with, with a limp and the doctor noticing that even if they've come in with a headache and picking up on it versus a patient identifying that as an issue themselves and going to the GP with it as a concern. So you need to articulate and they also need to monitor their bodies more. However, patients' accounts aren't always seen as credible. So here's one who said to me, I've tried to talk to them over the phone about my back. And they're going, all right, you've got a sore back. It's on your records. I go, no, this isn't sciatica. It's different. And they just wouldn't listen until I went down there and actually they felt where it hurt. And yeah, the doctor actually felt all the way along thinking it's going to hurt here because it's sciatica. And it didn't. A hurt middle of my spine up my back, where a sciatica is round here in your legs. So this is a um, participant who had been self-medicating on very strong painkillers she was borrowing or taking from a friend and alcohol as a way to manage the pain. Because she'd repeatedly tried to get herself seen by the GP, but they said to her, well, actually, we already know what's wrong with you and you're being treated for it. So this is a, another example of how once patients are asked to monitor their bodies, articulate their concerns, and then kind of verbally describe them over the phone without the use of visual communication, that they aren't always seen as credible witnesses or credible account givers of their own bodies. And um, fine, or second to last, mental health. So a lot of nonverbal and visual cues can be particularly challenging to kind of talk about without being seen in person. So here's a woman who had schizophrenia who said to me, if you could see me, you would know. She's probably struggling or whatever. She needs to talk. Whatever is going on, she needs to say it out loud and you know, because I feel like when I'm having an episode, my speech is faster, I think my eyes can look quite angry, I think my face looks tense. Even simple things, care, clothes, how I conduct myself, you can make a great diagnosis if you saw me physically. So this comes back to the issue of visual communication and the visual cues which are lost over the phone. And these are the kind of... Um, things that people might not actually tell you about on the phone, that I haven't washed my hair in a week, I'm feeling like my shoulders are tensed up. But if the GP can see them in person, they may be picking up on these things. So I think there's a risk of kind of safeguarding concerns here, um, especially around mental health, for symptoms which people may not talk about. And finally, listening. So a lot of people I spoke to said that they found it really difficult to know whether the GP was actually listening to what they were saying and hearing them properly. So this is a woman who's talking to about her back again. Because you can tell, like, when someone's listening, you can sort of tell they're listening and then they respond or whatever. On the phone, you don't really get that and you can't tell if someone's listening. So I had a lot of people saying this to me, that they were concerned that the GP wasn't listening to them, therefore they were less likely to disclose things to them, particularly if it's about mental health, because they said, I don't know if the GP's in a private space, for all they, I know they're cooking a curry and their partner's listening in during the consultation. Um, and interestingly, actually, I thought this was something I wouldn't see in the data, but talking to GPs, it happens. People talk to me about taking consultations over the breakfast table, getting their kids to be quiet. So it's a concern that patients have, and it actually might be reflected by GP behaviours in some cases. Um, a brief overview of the GP results. I'm not going to go into the data properly here. But GP spoke to me about needing to become more attuned to verbal communication, so pauses and tone of voice, etc. Um, and that sometimes or often comes down to the GP's kind of individual personality and their ability for this kind of communication. Um, they may use various techniques to manage diagnosis and safeguarding concerns when doing remote consultations. So asking more explicit questions, which can be very difficult, for instance, if you're asked about domestic violence. Um, or mental health, and I had accounts of people feeling uncomfortable asking about it and therefore not asking about it, which obviously comes with risks. I also heard about investigation inflation, so the idea that GPs would be more likely to send um, patients for investigations because they're not seeing them face to face and they need to mitigate for the potential risk of that. So in terms of what we know about the work being produced for patients, there is articulation work, there is noticing and monitoring work, and giving patients these forms of work is a form of responsabilization. So we're making patients responsible for that element of their care and their communication. 
Um, patient capacity um, will affect whether or not patients are able to do this effectively. And this comes down to language skills, networks, so who you have in your network who can advise you and, and help. Um, health literacy and communication skills, as well as symptom awareness, which becomes much more difficult if you're multi-morbid. If you've got a lot going on in your body, what we might call a noisy body, it's harder to pinpoint exactly what's going on sometimes, which makes this noticing and monitoring work much more challenging. There's also risk of less disclosure and also lower information quality, particularly for patients who struggle to talk about their bodies in a comprehensible way. So in terms of what we already knew, um, we already knew that remote consultations can throw up these kind of barriers. However, what the study con contributes is linking this into looking at how it interacts with marginalization and patient capacity. Um, and what this means is that we actually need to be very careful about having flexible systems. So when patients come up with reasons why they don't want to have remote consultation, kind of allowing flexibility that they can come in without having to say, I actually don't know how to talk about my body, or you know, I'm not gonna have a private space in which to do that in, which is another part of the study.